My name's Adam, as Greg mentioned there. Um, I'm one of the strength and conditioning scientists at the Royal Ballet. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we track kinetics and kinematics of jumping within Smart Space. So I'm going to try and do my best not to double up on some of the stuff Greg said, but there might be a bit of overlap here and there. Um, before I get started, I just want to say you know, thank you all for coming and a big thank you to Fusion Sport for inviting us out here. It's a real honor to come out and sort of talk about the work we're doing uh, with SmarterBase. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm not a dancer like Greg. I've got no background in performing arts. I've got really pointy feet though, uh, I've been told. Um, my undergrad was in strength and conditioning science. My master's was in sports rehabilitation. And I come from the world of weightlifting personally. That was sort of my passion in sport. So I try and draw those experiences into ballet where possible. Um, I've now been with the Royal Ballet for three years. I've been using Smarter Base for all of those three years. More recently, the last year or two, in the capacity of a builder. And this essentially means I get to go into the back end of Smarter Base and tinker around as if it's an Excel document. Uh, which is a lot of fun for me anyway. Um, so let's get into it. So I just wanted to start off by developing a bit of a context around jumping uh, in ballet. And uh, how I want to do this is just by showing you a video first. And I'm going to show you a video um, from the Sleeping Beauty. And it's a variation called Bluebird. And this variation has about eight minutes on stage total time. And in that time, they complete roughly 100 jumps. Um, so I think it, it's a really good starting point just to visually see what they have to do and some of the requirements. gives you quite a good impression of some of the demands of especially male ballet dancers. You know, they're completing a huge volume of jumps, they're working through multiple planes of motion throughout those variations, um, and then they also have some technical constraints placed on them as well. So if we put our ballet, ballet hats on, it's actually bad ballet technique if they flex at the hip. So then we can assume that they're probably not utilizing their hip as effectively as they could in uh, takeoff and in landing. So they have to stay bolt upright through that position. Um, they're also maximally externally rotated at the hip as well. So this is what they refer to as turnout. Um, so you can imagine that the glute complex is quite shortened. So if we think about length tension, length tension relationships, they're probably in quite an ineffective position for attenuating and producing force. And then finally, if we consider the ankle, they're maximally plantar flexed as they take off and land as well. And we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation with some of the interesting points around that. So um, before we go into some of the analysis stuff, I just want to um, develop an understanding of the workload. And to do this, I'm going to just talk about a couple of different areas. So I'm going to talk about their season a little bit. and some of the shows, and Greg already mentioned this a little bit, but I'll show you some of the visuals we utilize. Um, I'm then going to delve into each individual ballet, or one example of an individual ballet, and some of the casting around that, um, to understand how many roles each dancer can be cast for. And then finally, uh, I'm going to start talking about um, what each of these casted roles can actually look like, uh, and how they stack up upon one another. Um, and how we can make inferences into their sort of total workload. Um, and I'll give an example of a day as well. Um, and this will be until we sort of have more objective data, as Greg was alluding to, with the wearable technology. So this first visual is an Excel document that we use. 
Um, so this essentially is a two-month period of their, uh, uh, their season. So down the left-hand side, you can see all the different ballets that they're performing in. Um, and across the uh, top, you can see time. Uh, each different color represents a different ballet. So Greg was talking about how the different ballets overlap, and this is a visual demonstrating that. So you can see that each different color here is representing a different ballet. The dark points are the show days, uh, and the lighter points are the rehearsal periods. So you can see here we have one, two, three, four, five different ballets, and this is only within a two-month period. And you can start to see how these all overlap as well. If we sort of zone in on one of those particular ballets, and this is uh, Swan Lake, so this is a ballet that was just on recently, um, and we look at the soloist rank, so Greg alluded to the different <coughs> ranks, and the soloist is arguably one of the more challenging ranks within ballet, and this is because they're expected to do their supporting solo roles. They're often asked to do some quarter ballet roles, which is kind of like the backing dancers. Um, and sometimes they're given opportunities to do principal roles as well to try and prove themselves. So they kind of have to do a little bit of everything. Um, and if you look at this, there's a female dancer down here. She's been cast for nine different roles in one single ballet. Here we have uh, a male dancer, and he's been cast for six different roles in a single ballet. So you can start to understand how if we've got four or five ballets adding up at the same time, there's a huge amount of work that goes into this. Um, and it's not all about that uh, pristine final product that you see on stage. You know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's important to appreciate there's a lot more uh, underwater that you don't see. So, um, one of the ways we've started to understand it in the absence of things like wearable technology, is start to just quantify exactly um, what's happening for each of these different roles. And, and the way we've done that is to start creating Z-scores. So what we've done is looked at a couple of different roles within ballet uh, and started to quantify you know, how many jumps they have, um, how many uh, lifts they have for male roles, um, the total duration of these uh, in terms of stage time, um, and then the perceived difficulty as well. And we've taken an average of all of these and started to create a Z-score around that. Um, and you can start to see how those different roles start to add up as we layer them on. So this is a typical soloist uh, from the ballet of uh, the Sleeping Beauty. And you can start to see the different demands of each of those roles, whether it's jumps, lifts, duration, or uh, perceived difficulty, start to add up. And, and we've got the male bluebird in here. You can see uh, that there's about 100 jumps in this ballet, as we, as we mentioned before. Um, and if they're scheduled for a rehearsal for Bluebird, this is going to be an hour long. So we know that they're not just going to run through it one single time. They're going to be running through it multiple times. So we know that we've seen them conduct you know, in excess of 300 jumps in a one hour rehearsal. Um, and Greg talk, talked about class as well. Research has shown that they can complete in excess of 200 jumps just in class. Um, and this matches some of the anecdotal research we've done as well. Um, he, <clears throat> this is four different roles that this individual is scheduled for, um, and he told me a story about a particularly hard day that he had, and I just want to tell you about that. So he came in at 10 a.m. in the morning. He had class uh, from 10:30 to you know about 11:30, 12 o'clock. We know that that's roughly 200 jumps or so. Uh, he had a one-hour-long rehearsal for Bluebird, which we can assume is certainly over 100 jumps, could be up to 300 jumps. Uh, he had a Prince rehearsal, which is about 37 jumps, it shows here. Again, he would have run through this multiple times. He had a three-hour Crystal Pipe rehearsal for a, a new contemporary ballet called Flight Pattern. Um, albeit there wouldn't have been no jump, uh, any jumps in this particular rehearsal, because it's more contemporary, it would have been sort of deep flexion patterns, um, so a lot more time under tension as opposed to impact. Uh, and then he had a performance in the evening for Cavaliers, which was about 50 jumps. So you can start to appreciate how these contacts start to add up, and they far exceed any of our guidelines in strength and conditioning for biometric description. Um, and what's more is they don't really uh, adhere to our sort of recovery periods either. You know, if you were to recommend 48 hours, they, they would do this every day. 
So um, why am I talking about this? Why have I got so much Excel? I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to explain to you guys that dancers jump a lot, and it's really a really important part of their workload. Um, it's also no surprise that they have a lot of injuries around the lower limb then as well. Uh, and this is an example of one of our dashboards that we use for injury surveillance. Um, this is just one particular uh, graphic taken from it. It actually gives a vast amount of information. And on the right, you can see the injury count by body part. And the main bulk of this is made up of the leg, the foot, the ankle, um, essentially all the lower limb. So based on this, it's really easy to rationalize jump testing in this demographic. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So data collection, what do we do? Um, as Greg mentioned, we're lucky enough to have a force platform in-house. Uh, this is a muscle lab force platform. Um, we typically do bilateral and unilateral counter movement jumps on this. Uh, we can get some data from this. It will give us jump height automatically. We have a slightly deeper analysis, so we put it into Excel again, uh, which gives us more information. Um, but alongside this, we actually use the video uploader as well. Uh, which is through SmartBase, and this is a fantastic tool that you can use on your phone. You can film something, you can upload it automatically to your database under that dancer's profile, uh, and then reflect on it among other data. And this is something we do in medical meetings, uh, and it adds another layer of information around those decision-making processes. So, what does this look like? Um, this is a video of the video uploader uh, on the left here. So this. One particular dancer was doing some single leg jumps uh, and we just filmed it and we wanted a close up of the foot. Um, and the reason that is, you might be able to notice from the force trace, um, there's something interesting going on around the landing forces. Um, and this isn't specific to this particular individual. We see this across the board in all of our dancers, or maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so I just want to show you a close up of this. So we're getting this kind of double spike here in the force trace, uh, which is really interesting, I think, when you look at it. And what we think is going on here is when they have to land with an extremely plantar flexed ankle, as they impact the ground, they're hitting with the heads of their metatarsals initially, and we're getting this really aggressive spike in landing force. And then they almost completely offload here, and then engage their foot and then the heel comes down so you get this double landing and it's almost audible as well if you're coaching a dancer and you're working with them and they're jumping you can almost hear a double contact when they're landing it's really really bizarre i've never sort of seen that before in any other population so for us one of the key things that we wanted to look at was this spike and the way we look at that is by a calculation uh, we refer to as loading rate or landing rate of force development. So we take that peak force and the time to peak force and divide one by the other. And that's what we track longitudinally as one of our sort of key metrics. And we actually divide this by jump height as well. So it's then normalized if they sort of improve their jump height. I guess we expect to see that loading rate increase a little bit. So onto a bit more smart base. So how do we visualize that within smart base? Um, we have some dashboards that facilitate this longitudinal tracking so we can start to understand um, how jump height is changing and how loading rate is changing. Um, and I've got a couple examples I'm gonna to refer to. Greg mentioned uh, one of these that we're gonna start with. So this is the same individual uh, he talked about in regards to the pain to pressure threshold. Uh, which was a late stage uh, tibial stress fracture. Um, he had a 4B on one side, uh, which is um, a full black line under a scan, very nice. Um, if we look at our sort of top graphic here, we're looking at, when we refer to the bars, uh, unilateral jump height, and then if we look at the line, we can see the symmetry of that along uh, uh, this period of time. Um, and although there's a little bit of movement here, actually that's all within uh, a tolerable threshold, so that's all within about 10%. So actually this top visual isn't giving us a great deal of information, or, or the information it is giving us is, is telling us that everything's okay. If we start to look at this bottom visual, um, this is representing loading rate, unilateral loading rate relative to jump height in the bars, um, and then the symmetry of that in the line. And you can see this is the exact same timeline, the exact same data set. 
as we start to progress through, we get a huge spike, and I think this is around uh, 30 to 35 percent asymmetry at this point in time, which is showing us that something is going on in his landing forces. Um, and this coincided with an increase in sensitivity, excuse me, um, an increase in asymmetry of his pain to pressure thresholds as well. So we knew something was up. And what we did is we used um, one of the other dashboards that we have available to us that Greg kind of alluded to before, which can show total rehearsal time, so just total volume of rehearsals. And we had seen in the week preceding this jump testing that he had a spike in workload. He had a huge volume of rehearsals. So we were then able to use that information to reflect with the dancer that what happened with his workload, reflect with the artistic staff um, as to why he was becoming more symptomatic hopefully avoid any uh, of these um, increases in symptoms again in the future. So um, another example here, so this is an individual who had, um, he ended up having uh, two loose bodies removed from his posterior medial ankle, but initially we started with a conservative uh, treatment approach, um, and we started collecting some data around horses and jumps uh, throughout that process. Um, we had a, a really positive reaction from the intervention we put in place, so he actually had quite a significant increase in jump height, um, which is represented by these bars here, and quite a significant decrease in bilateral loading rate relative to jump height as well, so we had a really nice inverse relationship here. Um, likewise, we had improvements in unilateral loading rate, um, and the symmetry of that over the same time period, albeit a little bit more subtle. Um, unfortunately, this individual was actually still symptomatic in some specific ballet positions, so we ended up opting for surgery anyway, um, but he'll be moving towards a return to jump pathway in the next week or so, and we've got this historical data that we can now reflect back on for that return. Um, so that's just about everything I wanted to talk about and some of the detail I wanted to go into. Um, in terms of the future developments of SmartBase, I think pulling us further out of Excel and into SmartBase is a key thing. So streamlining that load quantification within SmartBase, creating a centralized database where we can analyze each individual's workload is a key focus. So this is going to be done through some of the work that we discussed today, some of the work that um, Greg discussed around their total rehearsal schedule, and then hopefully some of the future work we're going to do in terms of wearable technologies. Um, I think utilizing the video uploader further um, and improving our kinematic analysis of some of this information uh, would be really positive. And then smart speed as well. So we are fortunate enough to have a smart speed jump map. Um, so this is a fantastic tool that syncs with your phone um, and you can look at collecting jump data on an individual and it will automatically sync the smart base and upload that information to their profile. So there's no data entry associated with it whatsoever. So one of the, we've been using this in a couple of rehab cases um, and we want to start drawing this um, into the season for uh, continuous <coughs> testing throughout the season and, and larger group testing. Um, so yeah, that's just about everything. I think we've got the time at the end in which we can Thank you.